Hello, everyone. Uh, we'll get started in just a bit. I've gone ahead and shared a link here. Um, it's completely optional, but if you like, you'll be able to uh, go to the URL that I shared and we can walk through this together. Um, I think potentially it might be a little bit difficult to uh, follow along in such a short amount of time and go through it. Um, so I will leave this uh, scenario open and you'll be able to keep going um, for the next hour and a half, two hours, potentially. Um, so the, the link will bring you to this Katakoda training platform. Uh, this is what Datadog uses for all of its um, interactive workshops that we do. We also have a online learning platform, learn.datadoghq.com. Um, and there's, there's courses that you can kind of go through on your own at learn.datadoghq. Um, and here you can go at your own pace. Um, some pretty great, pretty specific courses. Monitoring, monitoring Kubernetes platform is a, a newer one. The introduction to APM is also a newer one. They're both pretty great and suggest you take a look. Uh, so repeating again for those who are just showing up now, I've, I've shared a link to that we can all use today. Um, normally workshops are two and a half hours. Uh, so in 50 minutes, we're gonna be a little bit uh, slightly rushed. So we will see how far along we get. Um, and we'll kind of just go along together for the ride. Um, so if I were to click uh, start scenario here, I'm gonna get dropped right into uh, the workshop. In order to conserve time, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go for it. Um, again, for those of you joining now, there's a, a couple ways to do this. Uh, normally, these workshops are two and a half hours long. Today, we only have 50 minutes, so I've spun up. Um, at this link, DTDG, that I've posted in the workshop roundtable uh, chat. Um, and with that link, you'll be able to get here and run through this scenario on your own. Um, the one thing I'll say is you can sign up for a trial. Um, and the one piece we'll need here in order to do this whole thing is the Datadog API key. Um, and you can sign up with a trial. There's no anything. You just sign up with any information. You'll be able to get started. Um, so once you click in and click Start Scenario, you're going to get this screen. Um, the one key piece that you're going to need is, again, that, that API key. And I can pull it up here real quick. Um, so within Datadog, you would go to Integrations. Or actually, you would go to APIs. And if I click into APIs, you're going to see there's application keys. Now, one of the nice things that we do here is by default, not share it. Uh, so if you if I were to hover over the purple, you would be able to see the API key. And that is the only key piece of information that we need. And again, it's integrations, APIs is where we're going to get an API key. Um, because we're doing such a compressed time frame today, um, this is something you know you can sign up for a trial and do it probably after the 50 minutes. Um, but with that, we can we can just get into it. So what I've done to pre-set up my environment is I've exported dd underscore api underscore key equals, and then I've just put my um, my API key there. Um, so I'm not going to do it here because I don't want to, you know, expose all of my API key credentials. Uh, so instead, what we'll do is we'll just assume that you've done this, and you can do this after we kind of do this intro part on your own pace, and we'll just start following along in the instructions. So what we have here um, is a few things. So up in this editor here, we have some Docker Compose files. And the one that we're going to be doing is Docker Compose Broken Instrumented. Um, and so this is going to be an entire microservices application. Uh, the idea here is that we have you know, a legacy Ruby on Rails application. And we're trying desperately to move to microservices because hypothetically, microservices allow us to ship quicker and better in general. Um, so there's a couple broken things in this scenario. And the scenario itself is also open source. Um, I can get, let's get that link and put it in the chat too, just in case everybody wants to look later. Ignore the uh, depend about alerts. Uh, so that will be the actual workshop. And if you don't want to use this platform or you run out of time and you don't get a chance to do it today, um, 
you can also um, you can also do it in your own time. Um, and so I think I've already, let's see, env. I'm going to check real quick to make sure that I have, since I opened up two of these, the right environment variable. Let me see, env pipe grep dd underscore api. Yes, this is the one. This is the right one. Let's clear that. Get it back in here. All right. So I've got the right API key here. And so to not confuse myself, I'm going to close this one. OK. So again, Docker Compose, um, microservices. These are all buzzwords we've all heard and know in general, right? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to spin this up. Um, and I'm exporting here right at the command line. You'll see two more environment variables. So a Postgres username and a Postgres password. Um, these are going to be applied directly into the context of the command itself, uh, Docker Compose, and then we're choosing the file, um, the, the broken instrument that I have up in the editor. Uh, let's see where we are. Am I in the right directory? No, I'm not. So I started in one browser and went to another. So let's try that again. And now we're pulling Docker images. And so now we can actually talk about what this is and how this works. So we mentioned before kind of the one key piece of information we needed in order to ship information to Datadog was that API key. Um, and if we look here, oh, and here's a quick tip about Hopin as a platform, which is what we're doing this, um, this on, is if you double click on my screen, you should be able to make it bigger and uh, Hopefully, you'll be able to read it. Um, again, if you click within the workshop and double click my screen, you'll be able to make it a bit bigger. Not terribly big, but uh, big enough that you'll be able to hopefully see and follow through what's going on. Um, so while we're spinning up this container, the environment, you'll see that Datadog itself is available. Um, Datadog works by an agent. Um, and so the agent uh, in non-containerized environments is a binary that you install. So it can be you know, packaged as a Debian package. It can be um, you know, any myriad ways of binaries that you install on the machine and you run it once per machine to ship metrics uh, up to Datadog. Uh, in the case of the agent, uh, container agent specifically, um, we use volume mounts to get the information on the underlying um, machine. So, a bit of confusion for people who are familiar with the idea of the Datadog agent and it being a binary. Uh, people tend to think, oh, I just you know, install this, this binary inside of every container I have. And the reason that you don't do that, the reason that you use the Datadog agent container instead is that you really want to collect and be specific about what containers are running on each host. And the way that we see what's happening within each container is via mounting the Docker socket. Um, into the Datadog agent container. So this means the Datadog agent container is able to see all of the containers you have running on that underlying host. And so there's no need to kind of go throwing that, that binary around everywhere in there. Um, uh, so, you know, one of those kind of minor things that you, you need to know and um, gives you a little bit of knowledge about how the agent itself works. So if I click into store dog now, now that I see um, I have stuff coming in, We'll, we'll see kind of the bad application we have, right? A team who has a legacy Rails app, they're trying to move to microservices, and man, this application is slow. If we go back over, we can see, you know, stuff is happening. I see logs coming out of here. Um, and yeah, the site itself takes a while to load. It looks like it took 20 seconds nearly to load the home page. I don't know of very many e-commerce stores who are successful with 20 second front page load times. Um, so if we click around, you know, you'll kind of notice a few things. Uh, it's slow, yes. If you keep clicking around, inevitably you'll get to a page that has an error. Um, and so in general, in production, you don't display the errors that are happening. Uh, so a customer would just see a page that doesn't work, right? Uh, just, just a crash or a page doesn't load. Um, as part of the process. And indeed, what we'll see here is that, you know, one of the teams deployed a recent piece of code 
that recent piece of code broke the site in small ways. Um, if you don't have something like observability in place, what tends to happen is you know, what I call myth-driven development. Um, you blame the last person who changed something. Um, if something goes wrong on the site and you don't have kind of a way to look at what's happening at the site, you just say, okay, what was the last piece we changed? It had to have been the last piece we changed. And so organizationally, if you try to move from you know, a monolithic application where you put the application out to one where you have multiple applications that are interlinked with interlinked dependencies, you know, a critical piece of it becomes being able to reason uh, about the pieces as a whole. Um, and so while I've been browsing around, if I switch back over to Datadog um, and I go into APM services, um, there's a couple things we should be able to see. So first and foremost, I'm not seeing any services reporting here yet. Um, if I go into traces, Right here, I'm gonna see a live view of what are called ingested traces. Um, and so right now I see nothing. If I go and I switch over and I reload the page, this is a great place to do kind of that, that first critical, have I hooked everything up? Do I have the right API key? Is everything being pushed to the right place? And so I'm gonna switch back over to Datadog and we're gonna see if we have any information coming in here. Um, and so far, it looks like I don't. Let's go over to logs two and let's do live tail. So potentially I copied and pasted or I switched um, browsers when I was showing off you know, one versus the other. So let's click into another. And let's click into another. And let's see if we get logs showing up in Datadog. Okay, so we don't. So this is good. Um, I'm gonna go back into APIs. And it looks like potentially I copied and pasted my API key wrong. So I'm gonna go application keys. I am going to move this away from the screen because I'm going to copy it. And I'm gonna go back over. I'm gonna control C. And of course, Hopin wants to let me know that I'm not allowed to see my screen. And then I am going to just pass this API key in. Okay. DD underscore API underscore key equals, and then I'm going to move this once more. Nobody look, nobody peek at my API key. I'm definitely not going to leak it again. All right. So with that, my API key. Oh, so we, we had an error too here. Let's let's take a look at this error too. Um, so spinning it back up, uh, my front end exited. Um, and so it says a server is already running. Um, so this uh, is kind of, you know, not supposed to happen, but you know, when it does happen, let's deal with it. Um, so one of my containers, this is running a Ruby on Rails application. Uh, is running in development mode. And so when it's running in development mode, there is this uh, temp file, PID server.pid. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete that, that server PID. So let's do that in a new terminal window. Um, CD, e-commerce availability, and I'm gonna go store front end, broken, instrumented, and I'm gonna go into store front end. I'm gonna go into, oh, let's just do this. Let's, let's do a quick Google. Docker compose up, delete, remove containers, remove cache. I think dash dash no cache. Yeah, let's do, let's do this. Let's just try this instead of trying to delete that right now. So I'm going to not leak my credentials one more time. Up, oh, and then do a no cache. And that is the wrong command.
let's see if we can get it. Locker can buzz up, no cash. Okay, so that was wrong. Okay, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm just gonna reload this. Let's see. Docker compose. Sorry about this, everybody. Uh, okay, dash force recreate. So I think I got it now. Force recreate. Yes, here we go. Okay, so we got it now. So, sorry about that. So what, what had happened to, to clarify here is that we had a, a temporary file that um, that persisted uh, across the container. So when I control C'd, I did a double control C and I pressed it twice and that actually removed the existing um, process we had running, um, but still left the cache container. So now we should be good. And so let's check and see, do we have traffic coming in? We can also pull Datadog back in here. Let's see what we got. Yes, we do. And is Datadog getting traffic? Let's go back over to Livetail and then switch back over, keep clicking through, and hopefully we'll have some stuff here. Let's see, keep clicking through, get our error here, go home, And if I switch over, still no events, huh? What could be going wrong here? Huh. Let's try one more chest. API key invalid, dropping transaction. So it's saying my API key is invalid here. Um, and if I look right here, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna create a new API key. Let's go over here, APIs. Oh, I think, don't tell me this is what I did. So I think that I unfortunately did the most boneheaded mistake uh, to do <laughs> during a demo. <laughs> so I totally copied and pasted my uh, application key, I'm thinking. Let me see if that's what I did. I'm going to take my my um, my my browser off the screen one more time, and then we'll we'll, we'll take a quick look here. Yes, a hundred percent. That's what I did. Off to a great start. We got it. We only ate seven minutes with this bonehead mistake, so we can do this. All right. Here we go. This is why it didn't work. All right, we're running off to the gates. Here we go. I am going to click store dog one more time. We'll see the application. Again, it's going to be slow. And we will go from there. So over here in the logs, I see stuff coming in. If I switch back over to Datadog, and I go to live tail, I will pull it back in, and we will continue as if I did not just copy the wrong API key. Um, so yeah, so now we see everything coming in, and now everything looks great. Uh, and so now we can start to reason about and do the rest of the workshop. So great, so live tail again, um, why, why, so let's talk a bit about 
how this went wrong, how I diagnosed it, and where we can go from here. So one of the things that happened when I spun up is that rather than going over here and increase integrations, APIs, um, for some reason, I clicked application keys rather than API keys. And the DD underscore API key is the only thing we need here. And so what I did, it's unfortunately, it's late here in Florida. Um, and what, what I did is rather than going to API keys, I clicked application keys. Um, and so there's two places to kind of, again, sanity check. Are you sending stuff to the right place? Is everything working? Uh, and those two places are on the traces page. Um, so this is going to ingest 100% of traces coming in. And so this will tell us, are we getting any actual data to Datadog? And so this has the lowest latency. Um, this and Livetail have the lowest latency where, you know, if you're deploying something to the cloud and you want to know whether or not that deployment worked, um, it can, the iteration cycle of deploying to the cloud and verifying things worked can be slow. And so having a way to verify things quickly is, is super important. And live tail and traces, logs, live tail and traces, both show you in you know, near real time, the traffic that is coming in. So if I were to go back to the page and I click into store dog and I click into discount clothing and we go over to the traces page, we're gonna see that 500 error come up in here pretty quickly. Um, and again, this slightly broken application is kind of what we're here to figure out. Um, so if I click into a product, we go back over, you'll see here's that 500 error, it's already come in, and we see the traffic from reloading the, the, the page right here. So all of this stuff is super low latency to be able to see what is happening uh, rapidly within your application. Um, cool. So now that, we, now that we've spun up the application, now that we've got something running, um, let's spin up some traffic. One of kind of my favorite tools in general is this thing called Go Replay. Um, so in Go Replay, which if we go into a new terminal, and uh, for those of you who clicked the link to be able to get to the Catacoda training, um, you can do kind of this plus button, open up new terminals, and each terminal is going to be the same machine. It's going to be access on the same machine. So I can see the exact same files if I cd into the commerce of observability and I run this, go replay is what it's called. What it's going to do is it's going to replay uh, traffic I recorded from my local machine um, over the network um, and into this application. Why is that important? Why are we doing that? Um, if you have a legacy application, one of the, the things that can happen is you have errors that occur that you have no idea why they're occurring, and you don't have really easy ways of recreating those errors. Um, so one of my favorite kind of hacks to deal with a legacy environment where you don't have great access and you can't really get in front of it is to record traffic going into it, to record production traffic. Um, so Go Replay is a tool written in Go to record and replay web traffic, um, which can be super critically important and a great way to debug things um, if you have a complicated deployment setup or you might not be able to have 100% of the best access that you have in a legacy environment. Um, so Go Replay running now is going to start giving us um, traffic into our application. It's going to fill out traffic into our application um, and filling out that traffic in the application will start to populate kind of the other pieces within Datadog. Um, and so right now, just kind of running that traffic and clicking around in the site um, with the right Datadog API key has started to populate Datadog um, with, with distributed traces. And so if I click in here, I'm gonna see all of the services that I have running within this application without really you know, um, having done anything. So I can see really at a glance, like there's a front end here, there's something called active record. It seems like we're using Postgres. The two microservices are a discount service and an advertisement service. Um, a critical thing to call out here is this ENV up here. Um, so 
I with a, a tag that is called ENV, you're able to um, to set separate environments for your applications. So in my case, with with Ruby Shop, I have my own personal site with its own environment here. With Ruby Shop, I can just see those applications for it. If you're a new developer, if you're just kind of experimenting with your own uh, company's instance of Datadog and you don't want to pollute everybody else's stuff and you're nervous, you can use this ENV tag to create your own environment and have just your little ecosystem of things. Um, so if I click into one of these, let's click into store front end, I'm going to see a couple things at a glance, right? The, the first is this alert to monitors um, in big, terrible, scary bread, uh, red. Um, so these are two monitors that I enabled. So one is high latency. High latency is critically important in uh, online store, right? If, if people can't load your site and can't load your site quickly, they're not going to be able to do anything. Um, and these are ones that are enabled by, that you can just enable by default. These are the automatically suggested ones. Um, and then the other one is literally the home page has a high latency. Um, and you'll see that we're actually failing those two monitors. Another thing you can see here is uh, our error rate, right? We have a certain number of requests coming through. Um, what's our error rate like? How much time are we spending in what portions of the application itself? Um, there's a new, nice new feature called version, version tacking, which happens later in the workshop, um, where you can say, you know, how is version A versus version B, or version 1.0 versus version 1.1? Um, and you can watch um, literally within these graphs, okay, version 1.1 is deployed. How many errors are we getting? Did we get rid of those errors? Pretty exciting thing. Um, and then we have kind of the overview of the application and how it's running. Uh, so here there's a couple things to note at a glance. In Rails, um, there is this idea of controllers. So the home controller should make sense. That's a, that's a home page. And we can see that we have pretty high latency, right? Our P99, 20 seconds, which is about what we saw on our first page load. Um, we can see that there are certain pages that have errors, and the certain pages that have errors are at basically 100% uh, error rate. So, if you know, if you had gotten a report from a user, uh, you know, the site is broken for me, and you had just deployed, um, and you 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 did you weren't quite sure um, what had happened, where it was, where they were getting it, you could come in here at a very high level and say, okay, li literally, there's one view that seems to be generating all of our errors. It's probably something going on in there. And indeed, if I click into it and we pick a trace. Um, we can actually see the error that's causing it. And so it's it's actually a, a template error, um, and it's an undefined method um, for nil class. So it seems like we've got a, a nil variable where we expected a value. Um, and so this right here is actually you know, a, a good segue into the request graph. Um, so this is a, a trace. Uh, the idea with a trace is we see units of work as they pass through our subsystems in a, a single unified view. Um, and so because we crashed here, this, this isn't probably the greatest trace to look at, um, but you kind of get an idea for how it works in general, right? Your single request to see the taxonomy controller um, generates a bunch of these subroutines. Now, all of these subroutines in, in Ruby on Rails are automatically instrumented out of the box. Let's uh, Let's continue looking at how this happens and how this works. Um, so we talked a bit about the agent. The agent runs once on every machine within your, your cluster, within your service, within your uh, entire setup. Uh, in, in our case, we have um, slash proc, um, which is going to get the underlying metrics for our hosts. I'm gonna make this big again. And then we also have our um, FSC group. So with, with these two, we're, we're, we're picking up on the underlying host that we're running, right? The underlying node that we're running. Um, what is happening on it? And indeed, if I go over into Datadog, and I go into in infrastructure, host map, um, I can see some information about the platform we're running Catacoda on. So host one is it. And I can see you know, we're running Linux. It's got two CPUs dedicated to it. It looks like it's got 4.1 gigs of memory. 
Um, and so we, we actually kind of get a feel for uh, the underlying platform we're running here. And we can kind of peek a bit behind the curtain of you know, what kind of CPUs we're running in Katacoda um, and, and see you know, how much space in the file system, et cetera. And all of that is possible even though we're just running the container, the agent as a container, because we've mounted those file systems within the container right here. Um, working with containers, uh, there's there's a couple patterns or anti-patterns. Uh, right here, we're, we're, we're using the Datadog agent. Let me make this a little bit bigger, hopefully. Um, we're using the Datadog agent, and right here, I've pinned a version number. Um, whenever you work with containers, it's critically important that you, you pin version numbers. If you leave this as latest, it's just going to pull whatever the latest version is, and that is such a bad anti-pattern to do um, in your production cluster to just have another variable that randomly changes without you doing anything. Um, so please, please, if you get anything out of this, pin your pin your numbers here, pin your container numbers. Um, and okay, I see this number. Where do I know, or how do I know what the what what version number to put here? This is actually a good point. Let's go to GitHub Datadog. A data dog agent. Um, we go to tags here on GitHub. So the data dog agent itself is open source. Um, and if I click tags, oh, I'm going to single sign on. Didn't see this. Didn't see this at all. Um, I can actually see all of the version numbers. So it looks like 7.22.1 is in our release candidate version two, um, and 7.220. Um, is decent. And so if I click notes, I'll be able to see kind of what's changed and what's coming. So we did see that release candidate. So, oh, there's no release notes for it yet. Um, so look at the release notes, see if it's important to you. If not, you can just pick the latest version number here. Um, and you can actually see we're, we're a bit behind here, 7.21.1. All right, dd underscore APM enabled and DD API, API key. We, we saw the API key um, at the beginning, right? Uh, the DD underscore API key. You want the a API key, not the app key. Do not make the uh, you know 12 o'clock at night mistake I made. Uh, use the API key. Um, and by not setting a value here, you see all the other ones have equals true here. By not setting a value here, it's gonna take the underlying um, operating systems environment variable and inject it into the container. So that's a very specific thing to um, running in Docker Compose, right? It's going to inject the external environment variable into there by default. APM enabled. This is enabled by default. You don't really need to set this. However, um, if I am writing code and I expect it to work a certain way, I always prefer to be direct about what I want it to do. I always prefer to say, you know what, I'm using APM here and I expect my code expects to have APM here. Uh, logs enabled, this is not a by default thing. So logs enabled true. At the same time, I'm saying I have logs and I want to be shipping logs. Uh, logs container can collect all equals true. This is just saying, you know what, ship up all the logs and send them to me. Process and agent enabled equals true. We go back over into Datadog, and we go into our containers. All right, let's do processes. I don't know if I did mount this right. Yes, I did. Um, so I can actually see all of the processes that are running. So we can see literally all the processes running within Katakoda as a platform, and also all of the processes running um, within our container. So I can kind of poke around behind the scenes again of Katakoda and how it works under the hood. And I can also see all of my containers. And we, we actually have a uh, container view too, where I can see specifically what containers I'm running. Um, and, and over here, I can pick a specific uh, container image, and I can see all of their image names, memory usage, let's pick into the front end. And I can kind of you know start poking around. I can see before we had that, um, development server temp PID show up. Uh, I can see that I'm running Puma in, in my entry point and that it gets called by you know, my Docker entry point. Along with that, I can see you know, how much CPU it's using, et cetera. 
Uh, we talked before about these ENV tags. The ENV tags show up here too. Uh, along with that, there's a couple other tags that come by default with our containers. Um, we have our service name, and we actually have a version number uh, associated with it. Cool. So let's go back and continue on through here. Uh, DD tags, ENV Ruby shop, we just chatted about that, right? So we're, we're setting that ENV tag here. It could be, you know, if you wanted to test your own thing, you could do ENV Ruby shop test two, whatever you wanted. Ports, 8126. This is, this is an important one. Um, there's a couple ways you can, um, you can build tracing, right? So uh, a request comes into your service. Uh, you, you check and see if there are headers in that request um, with trace information on it. If not, you could start a trace and then continue that down and continue that across your subservices. Subservices. So we have libraries that we use for each one of the languages um, that automatically instrument things. In the case of Rails, we have you know a Ruby-specific instrumenter. You could, hypothetically, write a library where you create traces and ship it directly to Datadog. That, that's not how Datadog chose to do things. Um, instead, the Datadog agent opens up this port 8126 for receiving traces. So why would you get traces and ship them to yourself and then ship to Datadog? There, there's a, a couple reasons for this decision um, that make a, a bit of sense. Um, so the number one critically important one is stripping out sensitive information. At, at no point do you want you know, potentially sensitive information leaving your data centers. So what we try to do at the agent level is ingest the traces get rid of you know anything that looks remotely close to pi because we are instrumenting databases right and we are instrumenting potentially sensitive things um, so get rid of it never let it leave the data center another thing we can do is if you have an extremely high level of traffic and you're really pushing your servers and you're trying to get as much as possible out of your servers um, potentially you're generating more traffic in instrumentation than you are in traffic coming in. Um, and so giving that, that agent on the underlying host gives us a variable to tweak of how much traffic we're sending out. So we can do a, a subset and we can change it and sample a set of the traffic um, rather than the default send everything out in kind of you know, potentially a stampeding herd uh, type way. OK, all of that being said, there's actually a, a place in Datadog that, that displays 100% of the traces coming in. Um, and this is a bit of a newer thing um, with Datadog. So let's see, are we still running? It does look like we're getting some errors, but we're still running that, that traffic generator. Let's actually look um, at our traces. So live search, this is a newer thing and it launched very quietly, but it is really one of the most amazing uh, pieces of Datadog in general. This is showing us 100% of the traces and incoming traffic to our site. Um, so we're able to see and filter in real time because we have such a contrived example. It's not, it doesn't come off as exciting as it really is, but imagine being able to just click into error and just be able to have a screen up that is showing literally every single error generated in, in your web application and where it's coming from. And to the level of detail where you can see the exact request order of everything that came through. Um, super critical if you've ever had to deal with, you know, trying to reproduce a bug and you have no idea where to start because it sounds like such an edge case. You know, the assumption is by default they're on Internet Explorer 10 or something along those lines. And you really have no idea where to begin because you've tried testing everything. Being able to see real live user traffic in, you know, not, you know, in computer science, there is the real time idea of real time. Um, but, you know, basically human scale real time uh, is amazing and super cool. 
So in the way you can do it here, you can also just say, you know, I want to see what, what's going on with this service here. Uh, click into it, and then we're just going to see the live traffic for just this specific subsurface. Um, so super uh, important. So I've kind of skipped ahead and missed one of the, you know, most, you know, visually cool kind of normal demo for distributed tracing in general. And that is the service map. Um, so we kind of talked about it before, but the way tracing works is it builds up a graph of your requests. So a request comes in, the, the library checks and sees, is there a header on here with a trace ID associated for it? If not, let's create a trace. Um, and then it creates what are called spans. And so spans have parent IDs. So each span that gets created underneath a trace has a parent ID. And so we build up a graph of the request as it comes out. So there's no, there's, there's nothing to do here. Just by having that graph of parent-child spans, we get to have um, this, this real, you know, again, real time, um, human scale real time uh, graph of how our application works in the real world. So there's no need to, um, you know, have architecture diagrams explaining how your code hypothetically works. Um, instead, you have these traces coming in and the traces are building up these graphs and via those trace graphs, we're able to show you a map of how your application is actually working. Um, and so I think that this is one of the, the amazing things about observability and about things like Datadog, because th there are other things that do this too. Um, but the critically important thing about observability and why so many people are caring about it now is that this unlocks um, the ability to build software beyond human scale. So when, when I started my career, um, you know, you kind of had to know the entire stack of your application. You had to know every piece of it and how it all came together. With tools like this and with observability tools, you no longer need to know the entire application yourself. You can explore the application and explore how it's currently working. So this is really a tool to move beyond human scale software building. This is a tool to build software that can scale um, beyond, you know, that, that single person's head. Um, so go, going back and, you know, reeling it in a bit. Um, so we can see here, there's a couple things um, to see here. Number one, this circle's red. The other circles don't have colors. Why is this circle red? Um, the circle is red because we have these monitors set up for it. So if, if these monitors were passing, the circle would be green. Another thing, let, let's, actually, let's actually add a monitor to this. Let's go back, let's click on the advertisement service and I will view the service overview. So there, there are no monitors on this yet. And you can see no monitors or synthetic tests. If I click here, I can add high latency. Yeah, I definitely want to enable that. I definitely want to know if my service has high latency. Um, abnormal change in throughput. Uh, I don't really care about that. Um, let's do the same for the discount service. New service overview. I'm going to add. And these are by default, right? I, ha I haven't done anything. I just clicked enable latency. Uh, latency is the thing I care about. So with that, and hopefully our traffic keeps running, eventually these will show up as either green or red too. And so now we have, yep, see they've gone from no color to, ooh, now we have gray, which means there's traffic coming in. The other thing, some of these circles are different sizes than others. What is that? The circle size is actually representative, if you see down here in the, um, in the uh, legend, which I keep trying to hover to and it keeps disappearing. Um, that uh, it's actually saying request per second. So visually, you know, I kind of see the, the graph of the application, but in the size and scale of the circles, I can get a feel for how much traffic each one of these is getting. So if, you know, I get told by my, my boss, hey, we're doing a big uh, campaign and we're gonna be on TV, we could potentially be getting tr triple the amount of traffic. Um, how is that going to stress and test our application. Well, 
come over to the service map and see, oh, actually we deployed a thing last week and it's kind of we kind of changed everything and I didn't know we deployed a thing last week. So this might become a huge bottleneck. Um, so a, another you know kind of visual thing to see and get a feel for um, in the service page. All right, so I've, I've kind of skipped around and we haven't really talked about how you trace at all. Um, so let's do that now. And again, sorry, this is such a compressed time frame for a workshop. Um, I Again, I have put in the chat, there's the live training platform. It's gonna be available for another couple hours. There's also the, the GitHub repo if you wanna do this on your own time. The only thing you need is that Datadog trial account. You just sign up and get the API key. And you can just do it on Docker Compose on your local laptop. You don't necessarily need to have the training platform. Um, but yeah, let's let's look at how tracing works in general. Um, and so I'm actually going to continue because we've talked about this. Um, yeah. So first and foremost, there's a library for for each one of these. Um, because we're a little bit close on time, I'm just going to jump to Python because I think Python has Python is my favorite language and you know, we're, we're just going to deal with it. Um, so, uh, first thing we do is we get the the Python tracer. So, GitHub, com, Datadog, ED, TracePy. Um, so, this is Python's tracing library. Um, and it's the same thing that we saw with the agent, right? If we go to tags, we'll be able to see release version numbers. You can see 4.2 has a release candidate 2. But really, 0.41.2 seems to be um, uh, actually a hot fix in general. It seems like it fixes a bug for Django view classes. Um, so if I go back over into Catacoda and I go to my requirements.txt, the way Python specifies requirements is via this um, requirements.txt file. Um, and I can see I have DD trace, but I'm all the way back on 4.0.0. So potentially, should look into upgrading that and look through the release notes and see if that's relevant. So that's the very first thing we do, right? We, we install the library into our application. Let's go back into the add service. And then let's look at our application itself. So ads.py. Major thing to note here. There is no import of the Datadog tracer at all. There's no... If I do, I would do a command F, but I don't think it would, it would work in this right now. But there's no importing of that library at all. So how does it work? Um, if we go back over into our compose, broken, instrumented, let's look. We're in, we're in the ad service. Let's scroll down to the ad service. Here it is, advertising. Um, so we're doing the same practice that we did before of having those environment variables. Um, in this case, we set our Flask app to be ads.py, which you know we have ads.py right here. That's the application we're looking at. Uh, Flask debug is set to one. That's not really relevant here. That's just so we have live reloading. If we wanted to live edit our code, which you can do in this scenario when you do it on your own time. Uh, Postgres password and username. Again, those are taken in from the underlying uh, host running on the computer uh, and injected into the container. DD underscore service. Okay, this is a new one. Uh, when you're working with containers, environment variables are kind of the name of the game. Um, and so we're setting DD service as an environment variable and we're setting a name for this service within Datadog. Now, a tricky thing to be aware of. DD underscore service works for APM. For logging, and you'll see I was inconsistent in naming. I've set a service name of ad service. And by the way, this is how you set parameters for logging. Um, it's by container labels. But sorry to jump. Um, DD underscore agent host. This is tricky. Um, we said before kind of containerized environments are different, right? We're not running the agent in every container. Instead, we have a single agent container and we mount the volume of the host into it. So it's like it's running on the host, grabbing everything. Um, DD underscore agent host. 
if we go into, and I think this is a worthwhile exercise. Let's see, you can see. Clear. Okay. So if we go into a container, let's let's do it. Docker PS. Um, and for some reason, I'm actually going to open up a new one. Let's see. Docker PS. And okay, it didn't get any better for me. <laughs> let's see here. Did I rescale this? No. Nothing. Okay. I'm not able to see the the bottom. So if I were to do a Docker PS, I will see. Um, yeah, let's go in here. Docker exec dash it. This container sh. Okay. So if I were to um, dd underscore agent host agent networking in containers. By default, each one of these tracing libraries is going to try to ship to localhost. And so localhost on this container is its own separate localhost. This is super confusing for people who don't work much with containers. Localhost for each container is its own separate localhost. So by default, the, the tracing library within containers will try to ship to itself and it won't go anywhere. So instead, we need to have a network linked to the agent container running on the underlying host. And so in Docker Compose, the way you one of the ways you one of the ways you could do it is via this depends on agent. And so if I actually go ping agent, you're gonna see the agent isn't actually running on localhost here. It's running on the Docker network and it's actually resolving to this IP address we wouldn't know ahead of time. So DD agent, DD underscore agent host is letting us uh, tell the, the Python library where it should be shipping these traces to. Um, DD underscore logs injection, that's just saying, you know, we want logs to be injected into the thing we're running. Um, and so that will automatically um, inject logs, um, inj inject trace IDs into logs. So we'll be able to correlate logs and traces, which we haven't seen because we're so short on time. Um, Trace analytics enabled, that's a, a feature in Datadog. DD underscore version, we talked about this. You bump this up to 1.1 and you can see it and switch between the two in the Datadog UI, super important. Um, so sorry for that detour to get in the container. All right, so wait, there's there's no library within Datadog. Um, we add the library to the container, but then we don't import it. How does that work? Um, the way it works is actually by this command right here. DD trace run. DD trace run in front of you know your UWSGI, whatever it is in your Python application, is going to automatically instrument it for you. So it's going to monkey patch all of your um, your Flask calls because Flask is a supported application. And if we look at our code, you see the one pattern that we have is that we use the app logger. Um, and that's it. Uh, other than that, we're, we're doing SQL Alchemy um, and SQL Alchemy and Flask using Flask's standard um, patterns is automatically instrumented and is automatically populated. So no configuration, zero um, kind of customization here. I'm going to pause here. I do know that there's a chat, but I don't know that I've been able to see anybody chatting in the chat. If there's any questions so far about you know signing up, doing a trial, or going through this on your own, happy to answer them. Um, if not, I'll, I will just continue and we'll just keep going um, with, with this. And you, again, I've created and spun up the, the training lab. You're free to go to it on your own time, go through it. Uh, we're a bit tight on time here. Um, yeah, let's let's start figuring out where things are broken. And so I, you know, so one of the things to do here um, is this this is broken. Let's let's fix it. Let's let's fix something. So if we go over into my Docker Compose broken. Um, you'll you'll see that I'm using an image called front end broken. I mean. Come on, who would deploy an image name front end broken? So if I control C here, let's see if I break everything again. Um, which is possible. 
And um, by the way, the way the way Catacoda works is there's no need to save things. It's going to um, it's going to um, automatically save for everything you edit, which is a blessing and a curse. And if we look here, let's look at the advertisement service. Uh, it has volumes mounted. So volumes allow us to do live reloading. So the advertisement service has a volume mounted within it. Um, and so within Docker Compose, uh, volumes allow you to, you know, work live on your computer and not have to go into the container or not have to rebuild the container. Um, so can be great to um, reduce the um, the iteration time, right? Kind of get that that feedback loop shorter and quicker and tighter. Um, so it's what we've done here. And so if I were to start editing the ad service, um, let's do something here. I think there's a time dot sleep here that's actually adding time. If I delete this, um, it's going to live reload the code, hypothetically. And things will just get magically faster now. So let's actually try to find that time dot sleep, the, the remaining bit of time that we have. So services, and are, we actually already have it up. Oh yeah, another thing. Um, so we're looking at the service, and there's this new Docker metrics thing here. So, so we can see um, for a specific service, how many containers are running for that service. Um, that might sound kind of contrived in the example application that we have here, just because it's so small. However, if you're running in production, and you, you have you know, Kubernetes, and you have a lot of services, kind of getting this container level information super critically important. So it seems like this is one of the bigger ones. Um, if I click into one of these traces, you should be able to see um, that a lot of the time with it, yep, yeah, okay. So this is one of the requests that um, comes into the, the, the home page, right? This is the, the product controller. And it does a, request, a get request for the ad service. Um, and you can see we do a very quick hit of the Postgres database, getting an advertisement ID. And the rest of the time is just spent in that time dot sleep. Um, and um, if we look over in logs, we can see that we, we have our trace IDs being injected into the logs. So we can actually correlate. So if I click on the log, I'm gonna jump right into context where that log was created. Again, um, doesn't sound as amazing um, until you kind of, and I don't know if this is gonna show up on the screen for you guys, but if I zoom in a bit, you'll be able to see that there's this actually going across multiple services. So I have the single trace associated with the logs as it passes through multiple services. So rather than kind of saying, okay, well, what time zone was it? What time frame was it? And jumping back and forth between a couple different UIs, it's just kind of, I click into the trace and I can see all of the associated logs with it at the same time that I can also see um, across each one. And if I click in, I'm gonna be able to see specifically you know, what happened here, what was the information. Um, and again, all grouped together, all ready to go for me. So I can actually see, in this case with the logs, I can see it was a Datadog tote was the product that was clicked on. Um, and then again, go straight back to the, the underlying trace um, and see it in context to have that context follow you around. All right, so we're getting pretty close to time. Let me, let me see if there's anything else that we've just got to look at um, in the workshop. Um, Probably not. I think the best thing to do would be empower you guys. Um, so again, feel free to sign up with a Datadog account. There is the, the, the learning lab. Let me open it up here. I'm going to click it and pull it in over here. So this is the learning lab. You're going to um, click start scenario, um, start scenario, and dd underscore API key is going to be the one environment variable you need to export. So again, export dd underscore api underscore key equals, um, and then once you export that, and I will actually, let's put that in the chat here. 
export dd underscore api underscore key equals with your api key uh, you'll be able to do everything in here and you'll be able to see it all going up and one of the things to note here this url is 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 a public url that gets generated so you can share this url with somebody else um, you can hit it you can hit it from other computers you can look at it from anywhere else and see it um, yeah uh, let me also pull up the e-commerce workshop repo so the e-commerce workshop repo is also open source and available um, feel free to look through here everything runs locally there's also not quite great instructions but um, a setup for running in ECS on AWS in GCP on OpenShift um, a bunch of different ways to deploy it we didn't mention real user monitoring but that's a thing you could do um, spinning up the traffic with go replay um, yeah and again all of this stuff and more there's also learn.datadoghq.com if you want to do more kind of self-paced learning uh, in this time. And yeah, thank you so much for spending this uh, compressed time frame with me. And I, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. With that, right at time. Bye.